It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Phil Kendall. So any of us who talk about Phil outside of earshot, I don't know, Phil, when you've been introduced, have you ever been referred to as the grandfather of treatments for child anxiety or the father of treatments for child anxiety? Here's the great thing about our next speaker. When, when he introduces himself to other folks, he's Phil. He's the most down-to-earth person in this business, kind to students, inspired you know, many different careers. You just rattle off the list. John Comer, Brian Chu, Jenny Hudson, uh, Michael Southern Jarreau, all these, all these folks. Uh, at some point intersected with, with, uh, with Phil at the, the grad school or postdoctoral level. All of us have learned a great deal about how to assess, understand, and treat child anxiety by reading Phil's pe papers. So uh, his work in that area, uh, in, that, in that specific area, is quite profound. And thankfully, every once in a while, uh, Phil steps back and says, and thinks to himself, I got something to say that that's relevant to my content domain, but probably also relevant to the rest of us. And when Phil does that, I sit up, I take notice, and I want to read the work. Um, so today, we have the pleasure of being able to uh, listen to Phil talk about the next few years in uh, mediators and mechanisms of change in treatment, and essentially some of the tough issues we'll have to grapple with on how we design our studies, how we test mechanisms of change, how do we do that accurately and precisely, and come to a better understanding of when our services improve well-being, why are they doing it? Why are they, are they helping out uh, the, the, the kids we're trying to help? Everyone, I give you Phil Kendall. Thank you, Andy. Um, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> As many of you know, I've given presentations on treating anxiety in kids. I've done the one hour, talk fast, very dense, everything you need to know, skip along the top of the water of all the many studies. And I've given the week-long training with the role plays and the supervisions. And I have in various pockets the go-to case studies to illustrate stuff. I don't have any of that today. Um, it's going to be less dense, and there are really just a few main ideas. And I like to be the funny Phil and have some anecdotes and stories, but today I'm the fussy Phil. Today all I'm really going to do is wag my finger at the many people, no one here, uh, who have used some of the terms in our field incorrectly. Um, and that's unfortunate. But you're the future. And so we'll now get it right. One of the dilemmas in our field is that, and we can go back to 1997, I believe, Grayson Holmbeck wrote a paper about the misuse of mediators and moderators. And it's still happening. Uh, but we're going to get it right. You guys are the future, so we're going to get it right. Uh, the other thing I want to say uh, is to give credit to Andy, who said that the presentation would be roughly 40 minutes. And I was going to do 20 minutes, and my colleague Matt Carper was going to do the other 20 minutes. Uh, and then, of course, when you get here, it's two hours. Um, <laughs> very clever. <laughs> uh, but the sad part of that is that uh, Matt Carper can't be here. Um, Matt is very much the statistician with the additional modern analyses that he would have talked about. Um, he has, he's at Brown. He has an internship completion at Brown. But during the year, had a couple of physical conditions requiring operations and missed many days. Uh, in addition, has a, a court issue as well. So he's there, nothing illegal. Um, uh, so he had to go back in order to finish up so that he'll have sufficient number of days. So um, I, I will say publicly, I let him off the hook and said I would do it for him. But I'm going to give it to him when I see him, because <laughs> some of what I have to say is really over my head. Um, so Matt's, Matt's not here. But at times, I will attempt to speak for Matt. So let's, let's get started. <clears throat> I bet you've seen this question. And I just want to start out with my finger wagging, 
by pointing out that many of you, not you, but the field, cite uh, Gordon Paul, 1967. That's wrong. Uh, Don Kiesler in 66 is the person who wrote the paper about the paradigms in psychology and, psychi and psychological treatments to try to study what conditions require what kind of treatment provided by what kind of person in what kind of setting. And they were both at the University of Illinois. No maladaptive attributions need to be made to Gordon Paul. They just published in papers that came out at different times. Um, Gordon Paul was in the behavioral mold. Don Kiesler was Rogerian. And Don Kiesler worked with Rogers, Gendlin, Truax, Kiesler, that famous first RCT of treating people with serious disorders. Um, it didn't go very far. They had some methodological shortcomings. But he was Rogerian. Gordon Paul wrote about it as an important question, and he was behavioral. And of course, in that era, behaviorism dominated, so everyone cited Gordon Paul. But if you want to be fussy, like Fussy Phil, uh, you want to cite Gordon, you don't want to cite Don Kiesler. Um, and I think Kiesler got it right. This is one of those cases, almost like B.F. Skinner, where you go back and you say, reinforcement works. Yeah, that was pretty clever. That's pretty good. And the schedules of reinforcement work. Wow, that's really clever. Uh, I think Kiesler got it right. There's no one treatment that works most effectively for everyone. So we do need to do something in order to identify what treatment when provided by whom works best for which people with which disorder. And I call your attention to another fussy fill. Uh, it doesn't say psychotherapy. Psychotherapy has baggage. It says psychological treatments. For those of you who are younger than I am, OK, for everybody here, <laughs> um, psychotherapy for years meant a traditional, analytic, lie-on-the-couch kind of approach. And for some people, certainly not members of this group, but for some people, it's still that way. And so when I've presented to Grand Rounds in a psychiatric hospital, for example, some people will come up and say, oh, exposures, I understand that. I do that in my practice of psychotherapy. And I say, what kind of psychotherapy do you practice? Well, I do sort of an analytic approach. I said, well, how do you do exposures? Well, we talk about things that are challenging for them, and the talking about it is the exposure. And I'm going, OK. Um, so if, if you don't mind being wagged at, try to use psychological treatments as opposed to psychotherapy. You'll avoid the excess baggage. OK, so Kiesler got it right. Let's see if I can navigate these slides. OK, <clears throat> I want to differentiate predictors, moderators, and mediators. Some of you are going to say, I know this. I learned it in graduate school. Some of you are going to say, I know this. I learned it in undergraduate school. And some of you are going to say, oh, I didn't know that. Um, a predictor is a variable that will have information about the likelihood of an outcome. So it's, it's sort of um, prognostic information. Most variables that we investigate are correlational, and they're merely prognostic. It'll tell you the degree to which this person is likely to improve. It should be assessed before treatment. It's important to note that a predictor does not tell you which treatment works best for which people. If treatment A works for, let me say it differently, if treatment A is better for girls than for boys, that's a predictor, not a moderator. So let me give you an example. In the follow-up of patients treated for anxiety, and no one will be surprised I'm going to use child anxiety as the, the case examples. Um, for youth treated for an anxiety disorder, the presence of parental anxiety at pretreatment wasn't a differential predictor, but the presence of a parental anxiety disorder was a predictor of differential follow-up. So it's a measured variable that has a relationship to the prognostic outcome at a follow-up point. OK, when we use predictor, we're going to be fussy fill. What about a moderator? And it's surprising that we, with IQs over at least 95, uh, continue to use the words incorrectly. 
A moderator is a variable that informs us for whom and under what circumstances a treatment is going to be effective. Moderators need to be baseline measures, and they interact with differential treatment outcome. So if you want to switch the word moderator with interaction, you're good, but you have to have different treatments in order to have a moderator because the outcomes have to be differential in that interaction. So moderators describe samples for which the inter intervention may be particularly effective. They don't say anything about mediation. So let me give you an example of a moderator. Take a study in which family CBT is provided for child anxiety and family education exposure, no, I'm sorry, change that. Family CBT is provided for child anxiety and then education and attention is provided for child anxiety. So you have two conditions, both involve mom, dad, and child and therapist, but one involves CBT and the other does not. Then you take into account individual CBT. In individual CBT, the kids are in the sessions, the parents are not. Okay? A moderator, in this instance, was a variable level of ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorders. When it was moderate, the kids did better in the family treatment. When it was low, the kids did better in the individual treatment. So the treatment's essentially the same except for family context. So you have two different treatment conditions, and you have an interaction or a moderator where the level of ASD differentially predicts who's going to do better. And it turns out if you follow up on the analyses, in the family condition, the parents did more out-of-session exposures, which might explain why the higher ASD kids did better in the family and the lower ASD kids did better in the individual. I, uh, I was tempted to next cite papers where people have used the term incorrectly, uh, but I have this need to be socially accepted. <laughs> and it's a strong need, so I've chosen not to do that. Um, let's go on to mediators. Wow. If you talk about misuse of terms, I've, um, I'm sure we've all reviewed papers, if not submitted our own. Uh, if not been involved with the review of other people's manuscripts where you see the other reviewers, uh, the number of times it's misused is phenomenal. And again, Grayson Holmbeck identified this problem in 1997. Anyway, a mediator is a variable that has implications for possible mechanisms. It must be assessed after randomizing patients. I'm sorry, it must have temporal precedence. So you can't measure pre, post, and follow-up and measure the variables at the same time and then analyze for mediation. You have to have the variable happen between pre and post and be assessed at that time point. A change in a mediating variable will tell you something about a possible mechanism of change. My hope is that you folks will get it right. I suspect you will, and perhaps many of you already have. A change in a mediator should have temporal precedence and can then be used to help explain, in almost causal fashion, what's likely to have been the active ingredient. Okay? Now, what about mediation in child and adolescent outcome studies? There are very, very few. And even in the ones in my niche, and I'm guilty in some of these as well, um, the methodology is not ideal. There are shortcomings. So if you took the early approach, which was Barron and Kenny, you'd be able to take a pre-variable and a post-variable, and you'd find a relationship, and then you'd plop in the B, the, interview, the uh, potential mediating variable. And if that variable was a significant relationship, you then wanted to remove the relationship between the pre and the post. Many studies were done, guilty, uh, including variables that did not have temporal precedence, where the variables were assessed at the same time. If you're looking for good examples, and there are several, there's a book coming out, uh, Alan Kasdan's done, there's a book that's not yet out, but it's being 
printed in, in galley stage that uh, John Weiss and colleagues have done. And there's even an article in the American psychologist Marv Goldfried wrote about looking for common basic principles. Um, and I think in, in many instances people get it right. Notice again my need to have social acceptance. I'm not talking about the people who didn't get it right. Anyway, um, when we study mediators, and I'm guilty of this, we'll take one or two variables that we think are potential or putative mediators, and we run the analyses. And then let's say you find support. You then say, this is a mediator. Well, it's not really a mediator. At best, it's a partial mediator. And we have to recognize that we might have tested one or two variables, and there could have been 20 or 30. And because one or two, and maybe you found one or two, were partial mediators, you can't eliminate the other 18 because you didn't evaluate them to know if they're also or even potentially stronger mediators. So again, it's a cautious language that's really needed when we talk about, about mediation. What we studied and what was supported, as well as what wasn't evaluated and perhaps not supported. So a couple of examples, and here I don't have to worry about social acceptance because I'm going to criticize my own work. So that's always good. Uh, in one study, we looked at changes in anxious self-talk. And so just a little background on how to measure anxious self-talk. How do you do that? You know, if you go up to a kid and you say, pardon me, what are you thinking right now? He's going to go, I don't know. Kids are not going to disclose what they're thinking. And if you, you know, try to do something stupid like say, you can tell me I'm a mental health professional. You know, <laughs> they're not, not going to tell you. So we came up with a questionnaire method that basically tries to normalize the process and says, everybody has things that pop into their head. And you can imagine a cartoon with the thought bubble. Everybody has things that pop into your head. Here are some things that have popped into the heads of other kids. How often do these things pop into your head? And that's our way of assessing anxious and sometimes depressive self-talk. So you know, the items on the questionnaire were not armchair developed. In other words, if I were to sit down and write them, that's an armchair approach. What we did instead was we went to schools, created modest effort, um, an emotional context, and asked them, what thought pops into your head? So in developing this measure of anxious self-talk, imagine I come to your fifth grade class and I said, guys, you've always wanted a yellow lab puppy. You're going to get one. What thought pops into your head? Write it down real quick. Guys, your family's had a yellow lab puppy and it passed away. What thought pops into your head? Write it down. Um, and similarly for anxiety and other things. And we would use emotional setups to collect all these thoughts that kids wrote down. Um, just for the sake of um, detail, you can imagine some of them. You know, you just won the lottery. What thought pops into your head? And the kid writes, trucks. You go, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so we did eliminate a few. Um, and we eliminated redundancies, but we kept many. I'll pick round numbers, say 150. Then we identified kids in the class who had anxiety disorder and kids who didn't and found out which items differentiate. And we found out which kids met criteria for depression and which didn't, and which items differentiated. Made the scale based solely on the items known to differentiate, and then cross-validated on a new sample. Okay. So these are reasonably good, I think, items that reflect the thoughts that pop into kids' heads that reflect anxious distress. What we found when we brought this measure to bear on studying mediators is that a change in anxious self-talk was, using the word incorrectly, a mediator of treatment outcome. We didn't have temporal precedence. That was measured at the same time, post, as the post-treatment evaluation. But when we did the Barron and Kenny approach, it was a significant indicator of a, um, a mediator. Others have done other things. Uh, there's a study that's done that um, compared it to a wait list and studies that have been done without a control group. And you have some shortcomings uh, that are related. 
do to that. Let's talk about another study. This one, very similar. I also did this with Kim Treadwell. Uh, we also studied mediators, potential mediators of outcome. This design was considered adequate by Barron and Kenny, but again, didn't have full temporal precedence. And we used a Sobel test, which was a statistical dance that helped us reduce the unwanted effects of indirect effects, but still, Change in negative, anxious self-talk was identified as a potential mediator, but not fully with temporal precedence. So now I can wag the finger at myself. Another study, this was done by uh, Candace Alfano and uh, Pina and others, um, looking at loneliness. And in this case, uh, changes in loneliness mediated post-treatment social anxiety. Uh, again, you got the problem of Temporal precedence. Um, fortunately, he's nodding and smiling. I love that. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's just the situation that the methodology hadn't advanced to the point. Now, they did do some things that allowed for uh, reducing of uh, type 1 error and power that were good, nevertheless. Okay, another study comes along. This one is done by Lau and all, et al., again, suggesting that change in negative self talk and improved coping sense of self-efficacy that I can face the things I used to not be able to face were mediators of outcome. Uh, and this one, uh, you know, it's consistent with the prior findings but has the same shortcomings. Hogendorn and their colleagues did a study. This time they had temporal precedence. So we're moving in the right direction. This is 2014. But they didn't have a control group. So while you can have temporal precedence and make stronger claims of the variable being a potential mediator, which is change in self-talk and increased in coping, you have sources of internal invalidity that can't be eliminated. No control group. And just for fun, I know uh, Andy had Al Kasdan for graduate class in methodology, and I know Leslie and uh, Lindsay have had me in a class like this. I bet you can cite, recite the sources of internal invalidity. Um, and there are a ton of them. You can't make statements about mediation when you can't eliminate multiple potential rival hypotheses. So I won't do it, but in your own minds, you can recite those. If you can't, check Campbell and Stanley. Great book on that. OK, let me talk about CAMS for a minute. Most of you know about CAMS. It's a large trial comparing CBT, coping cat, medication, sertraline, Zoloft, the combination of the two and a pill placebo. 488 kids done at six different universities. Many people, Tara, others have, have worked on the project and, and many papers have come out as a result of it. We attempted to look at coping and self, negative self-talk as a potential mediator. The literature to date had identified those two variables, methodology and weaknesses included. There was a consistent pattern. So what we decided to do was to go out to follow up in order to have some temporal precedence, because we would measure the variables of interest at post. So you'd have pre, post, and follow up, and we'd have temporal precedence by looking from pre to follow up. We created residual gain scores, and we proceeded to do that. And indeed, we found that um, an increase in self-perceived coping was the mediator of improvement but it wasn't perfect, um, as was identified by Gainer accurately. Uh, when you create residualized gain scores, you're using some of the measurement that was gathered at the same time as your outcome variable. So again, temporal precedence is a pressing issue. When it comes to studies of mediation, we're not there yet. Um, I want to encourage folks but I also want to recognize that temporal precedence is important and study multiple variables, not only the ones you want to support, but some potential alternates so you can not only say this does, but maybe this doesn't serve in a mediational role. As an aside, but because I think it's of interest, if you just take the um, sertraline condition, um, Hale et al., did a study looking at mediation of outcomes with baseline eight weeks, 12 weeks, and post-treatment and follow-up. Um, having temporal precedence 
and found that if you measure physical symptoms, physical symptom change mediated improvement, but only for those taking sertraline, not for CBT combination or pill placebo. So in the case of physical symptoms, with a decent study, with decent methodology, we have an indication of a mediator, but it's only a mediator for that one condition, the medication condition. So I've been talking and not changing my slides, apparently. <laughs> oh well. Um, so, although cautious language is needed and temporal precedence is needed, um, there are some suggestions and trajectories that we can pay attention to. So, I think it's important to note that we need multiple assessment points. And although Matt Carper is not here, if he were here, it would be his soapbox to get on. Uh, weekly assessments are probably going to be the recommended approach for mediational analysis. High frequency data collection. And in the modern times, that often means EMA, where you can have ecological momentary assessments. You can have smartphones. But you have to weigh some factors when it gets to talking about smartphones. Um, and some of this will be apparent to those of you who have done it. It will be novel to those of you who haven't. Um, initially, they respond, and the drop-off happens pretty quickly. So you might get a lot of answers, and then you get nothing. If, however, you pay them $50 a week, you tend to get a lot of responses. It's, again, that Skinner guy. He, he keeps coming back to him. Um, in the studies that I've done and that Jen Silk has done and that Matt and I and Jen have done, uh, there's a pattern that is not necessarily encouraging, and that is there'll be some initial responding, there'll be a big drop-off, not only in the number of times they respond, but in the fact that they even respond at all. It seems that you have to pay them, and you have to pay them substantially. And then you get to the point of having to decide how much is intrusive and how much is subject burden versus how much is necessary. Um, one approach, not necessarily perfect, is to use bursts. So if you have a 16-week treatment, you might do a burst of one week with assessments every day, and then six weeks in or five weeks in, a burst of assessments every day, and then another burst of assessments every day. So it's not the entire burden, but you do get a lot of assessments over a period of time. High frequency of assessment is probably going to be essential in, in future works. So now I'm Matt Carper. I'm a little taller, certainly thinner, uh, and in a minute I'll show you a picture. Uh, Matt would have presented this information probably with a little bit more enthusiasm. Um, I'm going to present it with a little bit less knowledge. <laughs> <clears throat> so one of the things that Matt would say is that there are limitations to the group approach. And I'm almost reminded of the single subject designs. For those of you who've studied randomized clinical trials and single subject designs, it's a similar kind of argument. Change is not equivalent across participants. OK, we know that. And in practice, the pattern of change can vary across participants. The assumption also in many studies is that change is linear, maybe quadratic, but it doesn't have to conform to those things. So I'm going to jump ahead for a minute and show you a slide that comes from CAMS in order to illustrate the non-linear nature of change in an effort to sort of suggest that not everybody has the same underlying uh, processes going on. So week zero, you can see all four are about the same. They're quite high on this particular measure. It indicates severe, moderate to severe um, anxious disorder. You can see the black line, which is placebo, ends up with not as much improvement as the other three groups. The red line is the combination treatment. It has the greatest magnitude of improvement. And the green and blue line, which are CBT and sertraline respectively, end up at the same place. The statistical analysis over time with those data points indicates a significant quadratic effect. The 
medication effect happens in the first portion of time. The CBT effect happens in the second portion of time. The CBT effect is greatest during the exposures. The medication effect is greatest during the initial time of taking the pills. Um, it's an over, the findings kind of overlap with one of the papers Tara Paris has done, where the inclusion or the impact of the exposures affects the trajectory of change. You have a pathway of change, but as you introduce different components, when you introduce exposure, that trajectory is improved significantly. So this is one illustration of getting to the same point by different pathways. And from the perspective that Matt would say if he were here, that's one of the arguments to be cautious about group designs. Okay. And you know, I just realized, given the presentation this morning, I should have had Matt do this long distance via Skype. <laughs> I'm going to get him for that. He, he could have suggested that. He knows this stuff. <clears throat> anyway, um, we've already mentioned that. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about a few things. One of them is called dynamical systems, dynamical systems approaches. And it's meant to look at ideographic change and potential use in mediation. So um, some terms, which you'll see up on the slide, um, attractors, these, these are stable patterns. And a, a, a phase change has to do with this stable pattern changing and then coming back together in a different way. And dynamical systems, as you might expect, can have quite the good application for um, treatment because that's exactly what therapy or psychological treatment is designed to do. Take stable, potentially maladaptive patterns and replace them with patterns that are more adaptive. And this is a statistical nightmare, but if Matt were here, he'd say it's easy. So there are very few existing studies that use dynamical systems. Um, there are a couple that I could mention and go into detail. They're with adults. Um, one found that those who developed less variability in anxiety showed greater reliable change. So it's the individual subject pattern of consistency that became more consistent, predicted to reliable change. Uh, Mar uh, Matt, help me with this one. This is confusing. <laughs> Um, this is similar. It's an increase in flexibility that was a differential predictor, again, using dynamical systems. Uh, this is the one I want to spend a few minutes on. This is the one that, that Matt actually conducted using dynamical systems approaches. And this, this is, um, you can read the, the slide, but I'll give you a picture that will illustrate things a little bit better. It's a state space grid. Each participant has EMA data and they're gathered and the relationships between bursts of EMA data, data collected every day for a week, let's say, are put on this space, state space grid. And dispersion has to do with how close or how disparate they are. So here you can see, these are extreme examples. This would not be the typical example. But an extreme example is on the left, showing a lot of dispersion example on the right with positive and negative affect showing more, uh, less diversion, more consistent patterns. And the idea here is to see if there are changes in the EMA data that have to do with positive and negative affect that have something to do with, with outcome. Um, some of the advantages that Matt would spend more time on than I will. And another table that requires Matt's help. So, another version of this approach is one that looks at, let me get to this one, um, temporal relationships between and potential mediators of outcome. Here the putative mediators and outcome occur at the same time. You assess them at the same time, but you assess them at multiple times. So let's say there are 10 times. You're going to have the same assessment points, but you're going to look at the different relationships over time back and forth. And there's one example that I'll, I'll give you. Uh, this example has to do with parents working with kids in family CBT, where you're looking at the alliance and outcome. And some people 
put a little bit more weight on the alliance. Some people put a little less weight on the alliance. But the alliance is there and it's important. Where does it have its impact? Well, as it turns out, if you use this approach, which is bivariate latent difference scores, mothers develop an alliance early in treatment and then see changes in anxiety. Fathers see changes in anxiety and then develop an alliance. I'm not surprised. Uh, the dads are a little tougher. But anyway, that reflects a difference in potential variables and almost a um, parent gender uh, moderator of that. I'm going to just mention a couple of other designs that, that Matt would spend more time on. Uh, smart designs, these are designs where randomization can occur at different points to assess if an intervention is having an effect and if it's not at one point you do another random assignment. Um, I'm not aware of a great deal of work using these approaches yet for mediation. Hopefully someone in the audience will go that next step um, because there are places for it. Uh, Bayesian approaches help. Matt, be here. I need you. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, I like the notion that Marv Goldfried and others put forth about common, not factors in treatment, like a good therapist, but common underlying principles of change or common mediating variables. Things that happen that change over time that may happen in treatment A, B, or C, but we need to test it to see. I think we need high frequency data collection points. I'm tired of being wrong and doing the methodology that isn't exactly right. So we now have weekly data and we can now do analyses that look at mediation with weekly data. Temporal precedence is absolutely required to do it correctly. And I'd like considering more person-centered approaches. Um, I'm not sure exactly how the world is going to work this out. When we do science, we create homogeneous groups of people to compare groups. And if you try to create a homogeneous group for every person, that's hard to do. And so we have to somehow find ways to collectively put people together that's meaningful. And I think we're trying, and I think we're getting there. Uh, but person-centered notions. Um, and for those of you who are in the grants business, um, PCORI, Person-Centered Outcomes Research, um, they very much emphasize person-centered approaches. And their approach, at least in part, is to emphasize the person's perception of what's important. So it's not just us saying, symptoms went down. It's not just us saying, you got better. It's their saying, I'm interested in more life satisfaction. How did that happen? I'm interested in getting a job. Did it affect me? So the person-centered part is also a reflection of people's input into the very variables we measure to see if there's outcome. Uh, Matt would say dynamical systems approaches, and I would too. If I understood him a little bit more, I'd even be more gung-ho. Uh, he would say that dynamical systems approaches uh, have, a, have the potential to contribute and understand mechanisms and moderators, uh, mediators. And I think the contribution is going to be the benefit of ideographics, the benefit of multiple assessment points, and taking into account the relationships of things, including potential outcome variables. It's not just A predicts to B. It's a whole bunch of relationships that may change over time predicting to an outcome. So I'm going to leave it to you uh, for the future. And I don't know how we are for time, but that's a wrap. Thank you for your attention. Sudden gains. Right. Negative self-talk might have an immediate change on mood. And so something like EMA, which you're already mentioning, could be worked into the multi-time scale analysis that you have at the second level, at the week level, and at the intervention level. So I just wanted to say yes and, uh, and build on that a little bit. Um, so I'm typically the science side. My brain works like trespassers will be experimented upon. <laughs> you know, um, 
But I've dealt with IRBs, and I also have a human side. And my human side says, wow, the science side wants to measure everything every day, every minute with EMA and physio and Apple devices. But then you've got the human burden. So I endorse exactly what you said. Just weigh it against, will they drop out if they have too much going on too often? And we want to be able to keep them in to get the data, so we have to weigh it. But I'm, I'm behind you. Yes, please. Related to that. Susan. Sorry. So, thanks, Andy. Um, so, uh, my question is kind of related to this. And what I struggle with is deploying EMA in a way that doesn't require such um, incentive. Excuse me, I have to answer a message here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the financial incentives, it's like, yeah, it, it's, it's a beast, so you, I get it. At the same time, it detracts from actually the deployability and, and how reasonable is this, and are, are we actually um, making the data funky by, by nature of having to get the data? Do you have yeah. any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't have an answer. I have, I have the struggles, the same as I suspect you do. Um, I like the idea of bursts. And Jen Silk gets, I think, credit for this. Instead of having too little data collected at too few time points, or too much data at too many time points that they drop out, you get a bunch of data, but you do it in bursts. Um, I, I think that's a reasonable solution. Um, we gave smartphones to kids. Uh, that didn't help. Um, we, we almost had contingent therapy sessions on whether you did it or not. That didn't help. Um, in one of Jen Silk's studies, she did, in fact, pay them 50 bucks. That helped. Um, but that's, that's very expensive. Um, and then you have the issue of when it goes off and where it goes off to trigger a response by the participant. And many schools won't allow you to have them in school. And so you've got Thursday through Monday, maybe. And it's weekend, which is non-peer time sometimes. Or it may be too much peer time uh, for Saturday night, let's say. See, Will it be representative? You've got a bunch of issues. I don't have answers. Uh, unless those of you who are in the position to do this are willing to have children who will be professional subjects. Because <laughs> then we could. Uh, that's my science side talking. Don't listen. Don't listen. Matt, did you have a hand up? Thank you, Phil. I feel uh, I, I appreciate Fussy Phil's uh, perspective on this, <laughs> um, and and you're right. We need to do do a better job, and and also you know I like that you're sort of fussing us into the future with new methodologies. I think you know the um, the thing I kept thinking about during this talk was you know the the other side of your process focused work relating to you know fidelity and implementation issues, and I guess the thing I I keep I, I keep going around and around about in my head is. Um, all of this kind of contemporary measurement approach uh, relies on fairly uniform uh, uniformity across the intervention condition. That is to say, um, you know, the, 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 the ability to, to, to say, you know, this really is the kind of CBT that's being delivered in your lab all the, all the time. And of course, you found that most people aren't necessarily, and Michael Southam Dro has found, you know, most people aren't necessarily doing it the same way. And, and I don't know, I don't know that we have the technology yet to sort of knit together those two different different lines of, of work, um, and 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 I keep end up getting back to a point as sort of a side that you made uh, at the you near know, the beginning. Where like ultimately, what where does that leave us? But back to sort of n of one type research. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. How do you resolve those those two lines? Um, so um, an umbrella comment first. Um, I think. Um, fidelity to a treatment is important. If treatment A has certain outcomes, then you need fidelity to treatment A. Um, with the intent of some humor, flexibility is also important because it's not lockstep. So I like to think of flexibility within fidelity, which, pronounce it correctly, it's not flexibility with infidelity. That's different. <laughs> it's flexibility within fidelity. And so everybody gets rewards, but they're different for different kids. No, no gender differences intended necessarily, but the kids pick, girl kids pick scrunchies and boy kids pick uh, little soccer balls or whatever. Um, but they all get rewards. Um, the exposures are different for 
most kids, uh, but they all get exposures. So when I think of fidelity, I think of what's necessary. And let's say it's CBT for anxiety. You gotta have exposure. You gotta have a relationship, maybe some problem solving and self-talk. We can debate other parts. If you don't have that, you don't have fidelity. And it's sad, and I think everyone here is aware of it, when you do a randomized clinical trial and you listen to tapes, usually you get fidelity. It's pretty good. A little secret that I'll let out, which I think others have already let out, in CAMS, there were several therapists in the CBT condition who had to be fired because they weren't doing CBT. Yet their data are still in the charts. Their data is still in there because once randomized, you're in that condition. But one could say the treatment might have been a little bit different, maybe more effective, had we been able to not include those participants. Um, so fidelity is important, and I think fidelity is necessary, but flexibility is also important. When I communicate with members of the mental health profession, professions, and talk about treating anxious kids, they really like the notion of flexibility. They go, oh, thank God you don't have to do it the same for everybody. Unfortunately, some take it too far. Some people will say, oh, I really like the chart where you have the thought bubbles. I'm going to use that. And I go, well, that's like one session or two or, you know, oh, no, that's all I'm going to do. And, and it's a problem. Um, again, if, if you were to have children who could become professional participants in research, we could control all these variables. If we could get an army of therapists who would do everything as we ask, we could study these variables, but they don't. And I, again, I'm going to predict everybody in here, predict, not moderate or mediate. I'm going to predict that everyone knows that when it comes time to do CBT for anxiety, what gets dropped is the exposures. You know, they like the psychoeducation part, and they like some of the rewards, and many practitioners find it difficult, and some legitimately, to do real genuine exposures, and that's what gets dropped. It's a challenge. I think when we study mediation, though, we should study it in a randomized clinical trial that has fidelity so we're not being sidetracked or misguided. So mediation studies should follow RCTs, in my view. Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for your, your presentation. I enjoyed it uh, very much. Um, one of the things that I almost feel I, I have this fussy need <laughs> uh, uh, to, to bring uh, to the table or sort of like remind folks is that, you know, sometimes I almost hear a data-driven uh, approach to the identification of mediators, uh, whether it is using an EMA, you know, uh, approach or, you know, the burst approach. And I just wanted to go back to the basics and sort of like um, emphasize that Yes, that makes a great deal of sense. It's useful, um, it's helpful, but it can even be more helpful if the measurement points are driven by the theory that underlines the intervention rather than by these ideas that we need to do a pretest, a post test, a 3, 6, 12, and so on. So, yes, those are important and you know, those are standard you know, measurement points, but let's just get back to the drawing board and articulate the theory of the intervention and uh, the dynamic relations among the elements in the intervention and the cascading effects through moderation and mediation that occur within the protocol and then after the protocol. Um, so that, that was just sort of like, you know, in I, mind. The, the notion that we should have theoretically determined assessment points to properly test mediation. That was a slide. Matt took it out. I, I was in there. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Uh, if I may, um, uh, another, another uh, comment that, that emerged as I was listening to, to the, the questions afterwards with this issue of um, uh, notification fatigue, which is this, um, when we send EMAs to people and you know, we want them to respond and then you know, there's like escalating ways to engage them, uh, but at some point they fatigue, so uh, meaning that uh, they get sick and tired of the notification and then they just ignore it completely. Um, and so there are 
are, there's some work being done in software engineering uh, where they're identifying uh, in which ways and at which points fatigue emerges. So, you know, to be safe, um, less than five notifications or requests for data uh, within two days uh, should be an initial, you know, baseline or an initial phase, you know, for us to uh, gather our data and not go beyond that because people will, will begin to ignore. Um, the other approach that is being used in uh, software engineering is that these EMAs are being embedded within um, hybrid uh, interventions, so interventions that have both face-to-face uh, -face contact and then uh, digital health, and the EMAs are embedded into the digital health component as if it was part of the intervention. So it's seamless and um, we can even uh, gather data as to when people are on their phones for example and what they're doing so that dynamically and intelligently the phone will not the phone but the algorithm will um, determine when is the best way uh, to gather the data from uh, the participant so those are some of the things that you know might be helpful that we are exploring at ASU thank you thank you any other questions? Um, thank you so much for your talk. I had a quick question in the context of what you've told us today. Oh, in the context of what you've told us today, I was wondering if you had different recommendations in terms of data collection methods, intervals, durations, depending on the age of the participants, like early childhood versus late oh. childhood versus adolescence. Um, let me give it some thought, and I'll attempt an answer. But others, please also, because I know we have several people who've, who've done this kind of work. Um, I'd say adolescents, it's easy um, to assume that they have some access to handheld devices that will allow them to respond. Um, you got to look at SES for the younger kids. Um, in our upper middle class community, they all have phones. That's not typical in an inner city, lower SES community. So that might be a variable to pay attention to. As I said, we gave them devices um, for a while. Um, that only helped in the beginning. Um, anybody else want to contribute on that one? Developmental differences in the likelihood of EMA responding and judgments that might need to be made with regard to that? Dr. Pina? Armando. <laughs> no need. Um, thank you. Um, so just so that I uh, um, make sure that I understand the question, you're asking about developmental differences in responsiveness to EMA in the context of owning a device? Is that, where the, is that the question? Yeah, so one of the things that, that we have learned, which you know, I'm sure you have to you know, also, uh, because you, I heard that you gave the kids the, some devices, um, is that you know, that's sort of like an initial reaction that we may have, well, you know, we've got this grant, we've got this research, we can just buy these devices, and even if they don't have it, you know, we'll just give it to them. And so for us, for example, for the, with the little ones, with the you know, younger ones, you know, one of the main issues that came up for us was that they were not charging the devices, so then they couldn't have access to it. So something so simple like that, that, that you don't really, you know, think about. Um, then there's the issues of like what kind of devices they might have and, you know, does the EMA approach that you have technology-wise fit with the device uh, uh, in terms of like if it's Andro and an Android versus iOS and what level of it is it and, you know, the nature of the questions that you're asking uh, in terms of the follow-up. Um, I think that, you know, in, in our experience, um, again, you know, to the intelligent approach of knowing when they're on their phone and what they're doing, and then increasingly forcefully, in a way, uh, trying to get them to respond where you might, you know, send in like an initial text message, for example, and then, you know, the, the little ones might not see it, but the adolescent is probably more likely to be on his or her phone, so they're more likely to respond to that. But then there's fatigue, and so there's additional strategies. For example, the EMA, at a, you know, at a third time of request, and they keep ignoring, might take over their phone, and they cannot go to any other 
app within the phone until they respond. So, so those are like levels of severity. If they still don't respond to that because they can turn off their phone and then turn it back on again, then you can have a system where you then you, you text or you, you know, get the parent involved and you say, this kiddo needs to answer this question. So there's like all these levels of, I mean, and your phone does these things, like when there is like an update, it keeps annoying you and annoying you to download the most recent update and you say, save it for later, well, when do you gonna download it? Okay, so you see that same approach is some of the approaches that could be used. Uh, there's also, you know, with the little ones, if they're doing more of like the gaming, you know, like video games of, for their particular age, the EMAs can be embedded or can, as a macro, uh, with the games that they play the most so that it shows up when they're playing the game or around the time that they might play the game and, you know, depending on the nature of the EMA, the, the data that you might be gathering. So really, you know, thinking about not so much what I want. I mean, this is sort of like the message that I keep hearing. Not so much what I want uh, in terms of like, oh, I want the data and I'm going to send them this, but embedding the research and the science within the context that they're using. For some kids, it might come up with the gaming. For some kids, it might come up, the EMA might come up as part of like, you know, not Facebook, but Instagram, or whatever they're doing. So their Xbox, uh, their Alexa in their house, you know, says, okay, it's time for this. That's an app too. Okay, hello, Johnny, are you there? Time to report, blah, blah, blah. You know, so those are like some of the things that folks are, are exploring, you know. Um, so. Big brother is watching. <laughs> The phone locking thing, I'd be intrigued to see what the floor and ceiling effects on responses are for that. Like, if you can't get back into your phone unless you respond, no, I'm really stressed <laughs> out. That's what I think. Yeah. Interesting. I, I think we have room for, yeah, one more question. A really important point within the context of this methodology is, is something that Armando said briefly, which is depending on the question you want to ask. And I think that that, especially as we're moving into this EMA era, you know, we really have to be careful to reframe our traditional approaches as intervention researchers of, well, I've got my, I use the mask all the time, so I'm going to use the mask. You know, you're not going to get kids to respond to all the items on the mask every hour, right? <laughs> and so uh, really thinking, you know, we, we really can't ask quite the same questions using that kind of methodology. And so I actually think in some ways it highlights exactly um, one of Phil's points about, about me. If we're thinking about mediation, we have to think much more carefully about mediation. We can't just say, well, I don't know, did change in my standardized measure precede change in my other standardized measure? Because I asked them again a bunch of times. But rather, you know, do I really feel like, you know, what, what, what can I get? Can I get um, one item instantaneously a bunch of times a day about their affect at this moment pertaining to their social interactions. Um, and, you know, if, if that's the mechanism I want to test, then, then probably you could get that and you can get better compliance because it's, it's easier and, and yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it, it does require kind of a, a subtler reframe of how we think about intervention work in addition to the question of how we can get people to actually answer the questions, we have to think about the questions we can ask. Yeah. Yeah. Armando's point yeah. about theory-driven questions because if you have one, Right. Choose it well. Right, exactly. One more. One yes. more little thing that I, I feel is very important for us to consider, and that is security issues when it comes to this data collection, because there are some of the barriers that we are experiencing. For example, you know, when Phil is talking about like the human subjects and participants participant Burton, you know, imagine, you know, a world where the, your phone would know, or the kid's phone would uh, let us know, we can do it, but it's not going to go through IRB, uh, GPS location, you know, geographical location. It looks like you're in a park. What are you doing? Are there some kids around? Who are you with? You want to go say hello, to, in the case of anxiety, you want to go say hello to a kid and invite them to play together? So something like that would never fly through an IRB because that's GPS location. So it's, it threatens, you know, the safety of the participant. But with proof you know, security measures, then we might be able to dream bigger and, and be more embedded in the ecology of the child and family. I think it's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.